Hebrews 12, you know, God's chastising or speaking of chastisement, and then at the end, he's a consuming fire. And when uh, Moses uh, gives the, uh, in, in Deuteronomy 3, where you find it, in Deuteronomy 4, I'm sorry, where you find Moses is commanding obedience, and we see that God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. But uh, let's go ahead and turn to uh, 1 John 1, 1 John 1. 1 John 1 and verse 5 through 7. And before I uh, we read that, if you'll turn there to 1 John 1, 5 through 7, uh, you know, what is fire? Because, you know, we've never, when we grow up, we, we learn these things, and then sometimes, you know, I, there's so many things that I learned in, in school and elementary, and, and we just take it for granted. And what's interesting, my dad, growing up, he was a big proponent of critical thinking. And I think that's one of the reasons that I've learned to enjoy the Bible so much is because it causes you to think critically about certain things. And, you know, sometimes he would ask me a question and he said, do you know what this is? And I would say, yes, I know what that is. And he's like, okay, well then teach me. Explain to me what this specific subject is. And then you're stuck. Have you ever had that question asked? You know, you little kids go through the why stage. And it's like, why is the sky blue? Why is the water blue? And why is there water in, 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 the, in the ocean and not in the land? And you, know, you, and you try to explain certain things. Eventually, they ask you enough why questions that you don't know the answer to, or you can't explain it just simply. You can't just say, well, the sky is blue because, well, it's blue. Yeah, you can turn around and say that, but you know what the next question is. Well, why is it just blue? Well, it's blue because, and then that's when you have to get into the science or the critical thinking of it. So when you think about fire, it's, it's interesting because no matter how bad far you go, I use the 1820 dictionary sometimes just to review things, or just go to dictionary.com, or just go to Webster's Dictionary. And you know, they give you very similar uh, definitions, you know, a state of process of instant, uh, a state, process, or instance of combustion in which fuel or other material ignited and combined with oxygen given off light, heat, and flame. So it really didn't tell you anything. It just tells you that there's light, heat, and flame, but nobody really, I mean, if you study it, nobody really knows what fire is, other than you need those elements, and you get a flame, and it's fire, and it consumes, right? As it's heat and light emanating visibly, perceive, uh, and you can perceive it and simultaneously from any body, and, and that's any body, not the one word, but two words, meaning any body that you can create that combustion, and you have that fuel source and that heat, It'll create that light and that flame. So we see by the title, by this verse, it confirms that God is a consuming fire. And you notice it's not just the fire. He's a consuming fire. And, you know, I just wanted to use that uh, verse in 1 John 1, 5 through 7, uh, that also backs up the definition of what the world defines as fire. It says, then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. What did they say fire is? It's, it's light. It's that combustion that you can visibly see. It's that light. It says, and in him is no darkness at all. What's interesting, though, is if you look at the everlasting fire or hell, it's utter darkness. So there is such a thing as a fire that you can't see. Now, that's hell, and we're not going to preach on that. We're going to touch it a little bit, but there's a, there's a big difference, right? It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not truth and do not the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us cleanses us from all sin and so a couple of things is I just gave you the basic definition of fire but actually if you look it also describes you know when you're in a spiritual spiritual state you, we've heard those terms like that guy's on fire sometimes we hear stuff like that guy's on fire for Christ or that guy's on fire for the Lord uh, you, you'll hear things like he burned in fury, there was a red rage, or he waxed hot, and it can be a both positive thing and a negative thing. But then the other thing that we've got to look at is, what is to consume? What, what does consumption mean? Well, we can look at the positive and the negative, and again, I'm just giving you basic definitions. I mean, we, I didn't go through all the 20 different things and how it applies, I'm just giving you the basic definitions here. You know, it's to destroy by separating parts of a thing, by decomposition, as a fire, or eating, devouring, and annihilating the form of substance. So God, with a consuming fire, annihilates certain things, right? Uh, fire consumes wood, coal, stubble, animals consume flesh and vegetables. 
You know, the other way that, that, that it's a consumption or consumption is is to destroy by dissipating or by use, to expand, to waste, to squander, or to consume and to stain. And the Bible speaks of both. God will consume as a fire in a positive light. And I'm going to prove that with the Bible. And then God can consume for waste. And he also can then give, leave a burning or a fire in the... Uh, in the reprobate, really that's where I'm headed, in the reprobate that is for waste, that it, that is just squandered, that it's it's to just dissipate, it has no use. It's going to end up being an empty uh, vessel or uh, it's going to create a vacuum. And you, you remember that experiment when we were in school where you had a candle and you would put a, a, a glass over it and the light would go out. And you know, when you got older, people would say, well, I don't know what generation we're speaking to, but the newer generations, they don't use candles as much. But when the lights went out, or every once in a while, you just light a candle. You know, I remember growing up, there was always a candle at our house. Uh, unfortunately, you know, my, my, I'm Hispanic, and we come from a Hispanic background where there's a lot of Catholic influence, and so candles are prevalent in Catholic homes. Or even if they're no longer Catholic, there's always like a candle for something. Uh, and I remember they would say, put out that candle, but the reality is you're not putting out the candle, is that the fire has consumed the entire oxygen inside of that glass, and so there's nothing left for it to consume. It's not that you put out the fire, but the fire put out everything around it. And so, you know, what is the fire? We've said it's a light, it gives off heat and flame, and then what is the consumption? You know, it's just something that you're gonna annihilate, you're gonna get rid of. So what are the things that God is a consuming fire in? Well, let's first go to James 4 before we jump. Now let's just, let's look at what the Bible actually says about consumption. It has a lot to say about consuming or consumption. We're going to see a lot of that. But I just wanted to give you one negative. And it says there in James 4, James 4 verse 1, James 4 verse 1, James 4 verse 1 says, From whence comes wars and fightings among you. And it sounds real familiar to our day. You know, where are these wars and all this fighting coming from? It says, come they not hence even from your lusts, that war in your members. The Bible talks about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and that, you know, there's a burning inside when we have that lust, right? It says, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So there's one example of something that gets consumed to waste. In other words, the world is just fighting wars or asking for money or looking at murder and they're asking for all these things, but they never they're never satisfied. You know, they they're never filled. And, and that's really where this study started because I remembered that that end of the verse. And, and I'm going to skip real quick. Go to the, uh, Proverbs 30:15, and uh, you know we'll come back to it. But go to Proverbs 30:15 real quick, and the Bible talks about the horse leech. And the horse leech is is basically a leech, and it's a blood sucking animal. You know, medicine will use it to, to clog up or uh, uh, coagulate blood so that you stop the bleeding. Apparently, it has you know it's used in certain things. But really, if you just end up in bad water, there'll be leeches, and they. They end up on you, and this this is what that's specifically talking about. But in Proverbs 30, verse 15, the Bible says, The horse leech had two daughters, and crying, give, give. And that's really a leech, right? A, a leech, if it latches on, it's just going to eat until it bursts. It's just going to suck blood until it bursts. It says, there are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say it is not enough. The grave is never satisfied. The bare womb is never satisfied. The earth that is not filled with water. And the fire that saith not, it is enough. And so the first point is, what is a consuming fire good for? Because I was going to actually use Proverbs 30 in the negative. And there is a negative uh, uh, leaning because I, I, I think this is also talking about hell. How the fire will never be satisfied. You know, that the devil's always looking to... Uh, to, to lead as many as he can to hell, and it's an everlasting fire. If it was satisfied, it'd have an end. But the other thing that that uh, it, it, it made me think about is how God, if he's a consuming fire, and you are looking to God, he's going to refine you. So he's going to help 
consume the iniquity or the sin out of your life so that you can be righteous for him or uh, reap better rewards and do more for his, his ministry. And I'm actually going to show that biblically here, but let's look at, you know, what is consuming a fire? And I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's okay. You know, we're going to go through all the points no matter what. But what is a consuming fire good for? What is a fire that consumes? You know, you can have a flame and then not have to consume anything but the oxygen around. You know, that's probably the least beneficial of all the fires, right? You just have a candle. It's just giving off light, but you're not using it for anything specific. But, you know, you can use fire for cooking. A consuming fire will, you know, you can use it for warmth, for light, for smelting or, or welding, and then you can use it for refining. And the Bible actually speaks on that. If you go to Proverbs 17, verse 3, Proverbs 17, verse 3, Proverbs 17, verse 3, let's go to Proverbs 17, verse 3, the Bible tells us uh, in Proverbs 17, verse 3, it says the finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tries the hearts. And you know, this is an example of how the Lord refines their hearts. And how does he do it? Through fiery trials. I'm going to go to those verses here in a second. And what's interesting though is if you go to Proverbs 20, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. If you go to Jeremiah 6, 30, you actually don't have to go there. I'll just read it. One of the, the first time you see the word reprobate in the Bible is in, in Jeremiah 6, 30. It says reprobate silver shall man call them because the Lord hath rejected them. And if you go uh, over to Proverbs 27 20, you'll see that it says hell and destruction are never full so the eyes of man are never satisfied as the finding pot for silver and the furnace for gold so is a man to his praise. So you see that hell and destruction are never satisfied. It's a consuming fire and brought you forth out of, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, so the eyes of man are never satisfied as a finding pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so as a man to his praise. So we see two examples here of the finding pot. The first one is God's trying the hearts. He's removing the dross or the iniquity, and he's leaving the good gold and the good silver. But then we see in Jeremiah 6, 30, it says, Reprobate silver shall call, may call them because the Lord hath rejected them. What is that? That's in today's term, if anybody's ever bought or sold silver, it's junk silver. It's no good because it's not 100% or 99.99%. That's how they sell it. Uh, good silver. And people are just going to reject it. And what the Bible is telling us in Proverbs 27, 20, says, Hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of men are never satisfied as the finding pot for silver and the first for gold. So as a man says, praise. See, men refine silver and gold for their benefit. And it's for the greed. But God refines silver and gold in our hearts to bring out the best in us. Uh, and, and this really doesn't have to do with fire, but I think it has to do with just heat in general. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And what's interesting is, if you've ever sharpened anything, that's one of the few things that I do enjoy doing. I love sharpening knives. I have sharpening tools all over the house. You know, one of them is a tungsten carbide uh, metal, because this is the strongest metal on earth. And, you know, when you take it to another metal, it'll bring out. And one of the things you got to do is, you know, if you don't have a good tool, you really got to work at it. And when you're shaping that blade, you're creating friction, and friction creates heat. And that's what that's what I like it to. When God's taking uh, men and women of God, whether it's Him working in your heart or you working with brothers and sisters in Christ, is you know He sharpens the countenance of us through through that friction, through that heat, through that trial, and, and He gets rid of the you know the burr and He gets rid of the dross or whatever it is that you're working on. And let's go. Prove that with the Bible. Go to 1 Peter 4.12. 1 Peter 4.12. This is probably uh, my favorite verse in the entire Bible. Uh, in the sense that this, this verse really resonated with me when I first got saved. And the reason that it was is, you know, I'm going to bring a, a message here in the future. And the message is going to be about how uh, some of the these Bible-believing Baptist churches... That they call them old IFB or, uh, or anything to that concern. They look just like the false religions. You know, for a long time, uh, when I got saved, uh, the only real major change I had to make in my life was go from Saturday to Sunday. Change in my life. In other words, it's growing in Christ and the biblical standard of what God wants us to do. My salvation was by grace. But 
uh, when I read this verse, it just stood out to me because one of the things that happens when you go to these uh, watered down churches is it's very positive. Everything's always, all the messages, even if they take something apart, they turn into a positive. And I, I agree. There's a lot of good stuff in the Bible, but there's also a lot of negative that we've got to talk about. And I remember this just stood out in my mind, and I'll probably use it for the rest of my life. It'll probably be one of the most consistent verses that I'll use for the rest of my ministry. But it says, Beloved, in 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. In other words, that consuming trial, right? What is it consuming? It's consuming the, the bad in our life that we have to fix as though some strange thing happened unto you. See, most of the time, we don't want to be in the trial. You know, the Bible, the people say, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. Well, guess what? There's a lot of Bible-believing Christians. There's a lot of safe individuals that aren't anywhere near the kitchen. They're out there in the living room, knitting sweaters. They're not getting dirty. They're not cutting up their hands, cutting, chopping vegetables and meat. They're not in the oven. You know what I'm saying? And it says, as though some strange thing happened to you. The other part of that is, sometimes we go through life and, and things happen. And we're focused on God's work. And, and our view of what should happen is not what God has in view for what should happen around. So, for example, we're doing the work. We expect that the results should always be exponential and grow. And God sometimes doesn't do that. But he says, look, as though some strange thing happened, don't, don't act shocked when I'm putting you through this fiery trial. Don't act like you didn't know what was happening. I've told you in, your, in my word that you're going through a fire trial. And it's not strange. And that's the, that's the other uh, great thing, right? It's not queer, you know. Queer means strange or weird, right? It's not queer. God, God's very consistent in the fact that He doesn't like anything queer. He doesn't like anything sorrow, you know, all that that when we tie to the sodomites. But it says, "But rejoice," verse for, uh, verse thirteen. Rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. That means He's consumed. What does he consume? All that bitterness, all that fear, all that anger, all that jealousy, all that lust, all that covetousness, or he's consuming, right? If you be, because you can't be happy during a trial unless you really love Christ. Because, you know, I mean, honestly, it makes no sense to our carnal flesh. It makes no sense to the worldly man how we would enjoy being reproached for his name, right? Because the next verse says, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, evil is spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer. And here's the things that, that God's consuming out of you. Right? What is a good, good consuming fire good for? It says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on his behalf. You know, we start out with that fiery trial. You know, you can't get rid of these feelings and you can't get rid of this sin and you can't uh, walk a straighter, narrower path if he's not trying you at constant time. See, if you're if it's easy peasy life, if it's always good, what's the point? I mean, wh where's the where's the challenge? You know, if people aren't giving you a hard time, if they're not leaving you, if they're not calling you out, if they're not preaching false, uh, falsely about you, they're not saying uh, negative things, if you're not going through trials and tribulations, then you're probably not living for God. Because he says, look, the love of thinking that strange, the fiery trial, which is to try you. And, and it's not always, you know, I know we, we all listen to a lot of these pastors, you know, we, we've been out there, we've seen like Pastor Jimenez, when he spoke out against the Sodomites, you know, during the Orlando uh, shooting two, two years ago, and he had the media onslaught. And, and, and it's going to be like that sometimes. I'm not downplaying the, the fiery trial that he went through, but not all of us have that platform. And so in our lives, we're facing trials and tribulations that we have to deal with. And, and the challenge is sometimes people will look at something like that and they're like, well, if I was facing that trial and tribulation, it's different. Actually, no, I mean, all your trials and tribulations are the ones God wants you. You can't get there unless you had a bunch of trials and tribulations that led up to that. Because see, the thing is, if you're uh, a babe in Christ, if you're a novice in the faith, and that onslaught comes, you're going to end up like that parable where it says some were choked and left as soon as the world got onto them. 
you know, and I'm not gonna, that's not, that's not in the message here, but it just made me think, you, you, you can't face the stronger trials if you haven't overcome the smaller ones, right? You can't be in the limelight and fight the devil on a bigger uh, platform if you can't even fight the devil on a smart platform. And when God says, look, if the reason you're, the reason this is happening is because you're not paying attention to that fiery trial which I put in your life. You know, you're, are you still watching the, the, the evil to you? You know, are you still just working for, for a paycheck? Are you still, you know, just thinking of the world? And are you still doing the things of the world? Why do you expect otherwise? When I put these trials in you, you run away. You're nowhere near the kitchen. So we know that the consuming fire is good for just refining it, for getting that dross and leaving a purified piece of gold or piece of silver. You know, and I'm using that in a metaphorical, spiritual way that we, God is going to refine us if we seek Him first, right? But let's go, uh, let's look at the next one, which is what is a consuming fire bad for? What, what is it bad for to the world? Well, you know, if you turn to Romans 1, and I know we use this a lot, but we are in that day and age where it just seems like this, this chapter has become the theme of Bible-believing, hard-preaching uh, Christians, in this case, Baptists, right? But Romans 1, and go down in verse 27, there's a couple of things that I want to focus on. I mean, I'm not going to focus on the whole chapter, but if you go down in verse 27, it says, And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another. So see, when God leaves a fire, a rejected fire in you, you're just burning. But it's not, you know, you want God to burn iniquity out of you. But if you're burning inside, it's different because now you're turning your mind to a whole other mess that, you know, we don't want to even talk about, right? It says, they burn in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of the error which was me. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. See, for them, they're not even at the point where they can think things are strength. Because God's not even putting them through a trial. Right? It says, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. It says, to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled. And, and what, the way that I look at this is, you know, if you're in the refining, if you have a refining pot. And you don't get the heat all the way up. You're just never going to refine that gold or that silver. It's just going to burn and burn. It could, you keep that temperature the same. You can just have the same result for as long as you want it. You can put it on low and simmer. Nothing's going to happen. See, when you when you refine metals, you've got to get that heat up and you got to get to a certain temperature and you got to keep it at that temperature until everything's done. But if you're just lazy about it or if you think that you know better or in this case you hate God, that's what's going on, right? Let's keep going on. That's not what I'm for, but that just popped in my mind right now. And verse 20 says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural reflection, implacable, unmerciful, who know in the judgment of God that they which commit sin, I mean such things, are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And the word that I really wanted to focus on, that's how my sermon, when I started writing it, started out. I was going to do the Proverbs 30, and how the fire is never enough, and how if you look at a reprobate, they're implacable. And that word implacable stands out to me, and I, I said that this morning, is, you know, Spanish, we use it a lot. You know, angry mothers use it on their children quite a bit before they take out their flip-flops and spank you. Because they, they, you know, my mom, all the time, I remember hearing this, like, like I could hear her say right now, están implacables. You know, in other words, you're implacable. Like, we, you, I've had enough. There's nothing I can do to get you to come to, to my side. And, you know, she'd spank us, and, and she hit us upside the head, and we kept doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. Now, of course, I'm not, we didn't do all this on the stones specifically speaking on this, that it stands out. And that's what's happening with God's consuming fire towards this. He's letting them burn in their lust. Eventually, he's going to consume them in an everlasting fire. But, but here's the danger, is if we're not preaching on the hard side, if we're not preaching that we need to get right with God, you know, after your salvation. See, church is for the saved. So when we're preaching up here, I'm telling you, look, we've got to, we've got to 
purge that sin from our life. We've got to allow God's consuming fire to cleanse us from all that iniquity because the challenge is we're going to just kind of keep giving into that. And, you know, the battle was won a few years ago from the world. You know, I know the victory's ours at the end, but they got this sodomite marriage. You know, and then they went all the way to the Supreme Court and they got queers to be able to marry on any state and all that stuff. And you think, well, that, that seemed to be the battle. That's it. But they're implacable. They don't care. If you give in to them, what are they all going after now? Uh, what are they going after now? Children. They want to be pedophiles and openly accepted pedophiles. A few months ago, I mentioned that there's like some Congress guy in like West Virginia or somewhere in Virginia. Uh, you know, you guys can look it up. That he's openly pedophile. Like this is what he, he this is his platform. That he wants to not only get voted into Congress, but that he believes that it's okay to do these things. And then when they get that, what comes next? I don't know. It's kind of scary if you think about it. But it's scary in the sense that it's scary to think what they're going to imagine. But we know what the end is. We have to stand strong on God's consumer. He says, I went before thee, he told him in Deuteronomy 9, right? Uh, he says, I'm going before thee, not because of your righteousness, but because they were more wicked. See, God will take care of that. But we have to be focused on him. The challenge is we're, we end up doing, the church ends up doing like Aaron, where they're going around and they're like, well, Moses has been gone for 40 days, so let's burn uh, all the gold and make a molten image and have some big old nasty party. And you know, the Bible is very, you know, you can, you can figure it out. I'm not gonna go into that. But let's go back to Proverbs 27. 20 says, health and destruction are never full, so the eyes of men are never satisfied. See, they're implacable. You can just, you know, you can intertwine that. It says, as the finding pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is the man to his praise. Yeah. So we see that, it, you know, there's good, good things that God can do with this consuming fire. I mean, he, he goes before thee, he destroys the land, he gives the victory. There's uh, there's bad things that that, uh, that that can happen. But a lot of times you also see it, uh, that it happens at once. In, in like a one-two punch or it's simultaneous, right? If you go to Deuteronomy 4, and we'll be there uh, just for a little bit, this is the other time that you see uh, uh, consuming fire. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those are the five easiest ones to uh, to get because, uh, you know, everybody learns those. In, in it. I mean, even growing up Seventh-day Adventist, we memorized the Bible. Those were like the first five you memorized. If you, if you forget the rest of the Bible, you probably never forget Genesis, Exodus, Deut uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Yeah, anyways, I don't know what. But go to Deuteronomy 4, you're going to see, uh, four, verse 20 says, But the Lord hath taken you. This is where Moses is commanding the obedience. I mean, there's more to it, but he's commanding the obedience before they go to the promised land, right? And he's telling them, I'm not going to go because of certain things. And he says on, in verse 20, he says, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as you are this day. In other words, they were under a fiery trial. It says in verse 24, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. In other words, God's telling us the reason that he's like this is because he's a jealous God. Because he doesn't want us to be in that because he has to then separate himself from us or give us up. It says, Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice, that he might instruct thee, and upon earth he showed thee his great fire, and thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire. So they, God, when he says that he's a consuming fire, he was visibly a fire to them. They heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. The mountain was on fire in Deuteronomy 9. You know, we see that it's, it's simultaneous right here because he's saying, look, I'm going before thee. He's preparing them a few chapters later. He says, I'm going to consume this, but I'm also reminding you that you guys are, I'm a jealous guy. And then I'm going before you because I took you out of that fire and trial. You're ready, but then you haven't been because you're stiff-necked and you're still hard-necked. I took you out of Egypt, and the minute I do, you go around and all you do is complain and you're murdering and you're thieves and you're busybodies and you know all the things that we just talked about. And then we go to 2 Kings 1. I'm not going to go through that whole story because it's long, but it's when Elijah uh, is, is dealing with King Ahaziah. Uh, sorry. Go to 2 Kings, chapter 1, 
We're going to go to verse 10. Chapter 1. 2 Kings 1. Second Kings 1, verse 10. It says, And Elijah answered, Well, let's set this up. This is a, a, a hazard. Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in verse 2 it tells us, right? And so now he's sick. And he said, and let's, let's just read verse 2. And it said, And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria, and he was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ikra? See, the challenge is today you got a lot of false preachers in good uh, in good churches or infiltrators or wolves and sheep's clothing, and they're whispering in the ears of the Bible believing Christians, the ones that are saved, and it's causing them to go question Beelzebub on what the things of the world are going to be. And so you get all of these weird doctors. If you ever study, you know, this is because I'm, I, you know, I, I, I was a, man, I was like a proud Adventist. And what I mean by that is, I mean, sundown came on Friday night, and I mean, I just turned off the TV, and I didn't do anything, and I didn't eat the unclean foods, and sundown, and I didn't do anything except go to church from Saturday morning, and then I'd, I'd come home and I'd nap, because you're supposed to rest, you know, on Sabbath, and then you go to church at night, and the sundown on Saturday, I was more late, right? And, and the challenge is, why would we do that? Because they follow Ellen G. White. You know, these so-called Christians are getting advice from Beelzebub. And, and Elijah's telling them there, look, there's no God? You you guys can't, 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 can't ask God. So then, the uh, curse or the or the commandment is that he's going to die, right? And then let's let's read verse ten, you know, because we'll preach on that a whole we'll preach on this chapter a whole other day. But here it says, and Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, "If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee." And I fifty, and there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So we see that God's doing a good thing. But he's, because it's an open show, but he's also consuming the, 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 the bad, right? And then they come again, verse 12, And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven, and consume thee in thy fifty. And fire came down from heaven, and consumed his fifty. And then verse 13, he said, and, I, and he sent again a captain of the third fifty with fifty, and the third captain went, and went up, and came, and fell on his knees before Elijah, and beside him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the, the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. So see, what he did is, now they understood that God is a consuming fire. There was a fiery trial, and some of them, their hearts, understood who they were dealing with. The first hundred didn't. God burned them up. The last fifty came, and they're like, look, we know who, who, who we're dealing with here. This is God Almighty. This is, you know, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's go down to Luke 9, 54. And, and we see this, God uses it for mighty power, but then he also reminds us that it's not always the way we think. God's consuming power is not the way we want it. See, that's the problem with the, with the Christians today. We're warmongers, and, and we want to just kill everybody. We don't want to do the gospel. We just want to get oil and gas and kill everybody. Go to, uh, go to uh, Luke. Luke 9, verse 54. And what, is he t what does Jesus tell uh, the apostles here? So John 9, verse 54. And he says, And when the disciples, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not of what manner of spirit ye are. For the Son of Man hath not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went down to another uh, another, another village. And so we see that the consuming fire is God's to do what he needs to do. With. And then we see also that 
when Jesus came and became the spiritual fiery child, we see that in 1 Peter 4.12, you know, they, they were real excited that they wanted to be like Elijah. And that's the problem, right? That's what I, I keep saying is we see sometimes the, uh, the ministry when we do the work of the Lord and then we see other, other people doing certain things, whether it's actually good or whether it's bad, and we're like, oh, man, maybe I need to do that. And God says, no, look, he's going to rebuke us and say, and say, you, ye know now what manner of spirit ye are of. In other words, stay focused. And what they, what did he make them do immediately after he rebuked them? They went to another village. And I guarantee you they went to another village to go so weird. Right? That's the challenge is that we're going to either let God consume the iniquity out of us, or we're going to let, we're going to go before him. Not before, like he said, I went before thee. But we, we have a tendency to want to get in front of God. And what God does is then he puts us through that fire of trial. Let's, uh, let's close out uh, with a couple of things. We've got to have uh, satisfaction in God's consuming fire. Because, you know, God is never... There's two reasons why there's satisfaction in God's consuming fire. You know, God is never satisfied with our sin. You know, because it separates us from Him. That's why He has to consume it, right? That's why Jesus died on the cross. But for us, for our sin, right? But that's for salvation. But if we want to grow in Christ... If we want to come to church and say, you know what, I don't, I don't want to just show up Wednesday and Sunday morning and Sunday night and just take notes and go home and then be bad at hell. I want to actually improve my life. Then you're going to listen to the preaching and you're going to do the things that God has said in his word. Right? Because we're separate from what do we teach. You know, for all I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there's, there's not righteous, no, not one. For You know, we're separate. It's not in the kind of destituidos. We're, you know, there's this chasm between us and God. And the only way to fill it is through Jesus Christ. You know, sin is, and the other thing, the negative is, if we don't preach to the world, God's consuming fire, well, there's a fire that he's going to let burn for all eternity. Because sin is never satisfied with sin, because it wants more wicked and perverse things. That's why we're in the, in the path that we're going. Because, see, the thing is, you know, they say, oh, well, yeah, I've heard articles, porn is really good for your marriage, or for this and for that. No. Porn is really bad because it's gotten to this point. Because you're never satisfied. If you do studies on, on, on porn addiction, it's not just the addiction itself, but it's the fact that it starts out with something real simple. And most guys can tell you, and they remember, you know, they do the studies, they're like, oh, I just started with one magazine. Or I, I bumped into, I went in, it was in my dad, at my friend's house, and his dad had him in the, the bed, and I saw one image. That image turns into certain videos. And then those certain videos become more wicked and more wicked. And then they're never satisfied with just the regular stuff. And so then they start going and looking at stuff that's just beyond anything you could ever imagine. And so what happens is if you're doing it, then you turn into your life, right? That's why sodomy is okay. That's why pedophilia is okay. That's why I think bestiality is coming next. And, and all these things. Because what happens is that sin is never satisfied with just enough sin. If you tell one lie... And, and you're really you're really set on your lie. You're going to tell another, and then you're going to tell another. And and the one lie that started out as oh you know uh, I wasn't eating the cookies turns into it wasn't just me not eating the cookies. Dad was the one who. I mean you just now you're blaming. Now you're just making stuff up left and right. But look what's going on in the world today. You know we're just constantly being uh, fed lies and fed news. But let's go ahead and just close out. You know obviously Hebrews twelve twenty nine. That's for our guys and consuming fire. I just wanted to make sure you reminded you of that. But uh, if you go to Ephesians 6, actually go to Daniel 3 because that's where we're going to close. Daniel 3, and I'm just going to read for you uh, Ephesians 6. And the Bible says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. See, God's consuming fire can quench and consume the fiery darts. See, if you ever, if you had a, a, a fire pit right here to my, my left, and, and it was a big fire. And I took a, a bow and arrow and I had a fiery dart and I shot it into that fire. That dart wouldn't do anything to that fire, just be consumed. Fire can consume smaller fires. That's how, you know, forest fires get taken over, right? It's a little fire starts clearing a little more and then there's a bigger one that joins up with the rest and takes over. But let's see how God will purge the iniquity from our lives with the consuming fire and will use this for great feats. In Daniel 3, go to verse 13. It says that Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I think you guys know what I'm talking about. This is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they've now denied bowing down before a false idol. They're like, no, we're not going to do it. 
And it says, Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is this true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Go down to verse 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. There's that fiery trial that I just talked about in 1 Peter 4, 12. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image with thou set up. See, they didn't put a condition on their servitude toward Christ. They're willing to serve Christ no matter the consequences. They said, whether he saves us out of the fire, or whether he consumes us in that fire, we know the victory is ours eternal. That's the problem is, that's how you know that salvation by works is a really false uh, an evil, wicked doctrine from the pit of hell because it's always based on a condition. You can get to heaven conditionally based on you instead of Christ. You remove the power of God. Let's go uh, down to verse uh, 19. It says, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage changed against Shadrach, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded they should not, that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were with it, that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. The thing that stands out right there is that he, he threw them in with everything. Well, you know, if, it, if you know anything about, you know, if you catch on fire, you don't want to have any clothes because it's flammable. It's just the burning's going to be that much worse. I mean, he was so mad that he upped the, the heat of the furnace, and then he's like, I'm going to tie you up so that the, the clothes sticks to you and burns you faster, and it's more uh, painful, right? It says, therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, in verse 22, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God's consuming fire got rid of the evil. But he talk, he's already uh, purged the iniquity. He's already taken them through the trial for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, down in the midst of the ver burning fire furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was a, a, sto a story, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? The answer is unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came to the mouth of the burning fire furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High, come forth, come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and the captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was any hair of their head cinched. Neither were their clothes changed, or the smell of fire passed on them. See, what happened is, they were willing to go through the fiery trial so that the fire wouldn't burn them, but get rid of the, 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 the iniquity, sin in their lives. See, they already had taken that stand. See, most of the time, it's real good to speak of Christ, but then we, won't, we don't want to stand on Christ, right? We don't want to stand for Christ. And it says, therefore, uh, and let's look at verse 28. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm done. It says, The Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, he said in verse, in Deuteronomy 9, he says, I go before thee, and you're getting the victory, not because you're righteous, but because of me. And here, he changes the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. He says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve or worship any god except their own god. And then it gets even better. So I believe that we can still change the tide of government even today. He says, therefore I make a decree that every people, nation and language, which speak anything amiss against God, uh, against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there's no other God that can deliver after the sword. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And so what we see here is that God's consuming fire can change your life. It's going to change your life. Either he's going to purge that iniquity, he's going to cleanse us, make us find silver and find gold, or there's an everlasting fire. 
and it will be consuming forever and ever. And it makes sense now that there would be an eternal hell because sin is never satisfied. So it's not like you can burn the sin up. Let's say sin was uh, A through Z and you threw it in hell and it burned up. It would never be A through Z because once you got to Z, it, it would be AA and BB and ZZ. It's never satisfied. It just want more and more. So it has to be eternal. That's the only way to keep it separate from God. It's the only way to consume it, to annihilate it from His kingdom so that when we get there, we have everlasting joy and we have everlasting peace and we have everlasting victory you know, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's go ahead and close the word in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the message that you laid in my heart. And more importantly, Lord, I pray that the message that you went before, before us, before me, and that it was your message in spite of me, that if there is any victory today, if there's any victory out there, and there's so many, that we be reminded it's your consuming fire that went before us, and that it's already laid down the groundwork, and that your word doesn't return void, and that at the end of the day, if we have one saved, 20 saved, that we don't pat ourselves on the back and say, it was because I'm so good at the gospel and the presentation, or I did this, or I did that. Remove that spirit from us and help us to go through the fiery trials so that we're happy and we're reproached for your name, that we suffer for you, Lord. We suffer in Christ's name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.